Hello, everybody. Good evening. I guess for some, it's good morning, good afternoon. We have a worldwide audience, and it's wonderful to see everybody tonight. As you heard, this is a new program for us. Um, and I think one of the few programs I've been involved where you're going to hear from not just the physicians, but patients as well. So this patient and, and provider perspective, we know in our own inflammatory bowel disease practices that shared decision, having the patient's voice in the discussion in terms of making decisions is so important and so imperative. So if you like tonight, this is the first of a, a four part series. So uh, please join us for the others. Um, we will have a presenter, Dr. Katie Falloon. Uh, in a minute, you'll also hear from the moderator, Dr. Ben Cohen. Next slide. So this is a worldwide scope. We have over 340 patients and healthcare providers who've registered for today. Um, many of you are logging on, um, and I see the numbers continuing to rise. So I know uh, this is uh, reaching again a true global market and global audience. Next slide. We also want to thank our sponsors. We want to thank AbbVie and Takeda Pharmaceuticals America Inc. for their generosity in supporting the Cleveland Clinic patient and provider perspectives on the IBD management series. Next slide. So who are we? Um, Dr. Ben Cohen uh, works with me, one of the IBD directors of the IBD Center here at Cleveland Clinic. Uh, I'm Miguel Reguero. I'm the chief for the Digestive Disease Institute. I also see patients with IBD. Dr. Katie Falloon, who you'll hear from in a minute and hear a presentation, is one of our IBDologists and new staff at Cleveland Clinic. Uh, Dr. Jessica Philpot is also a gastroenterologist and IBD expert who will be joining me on the panel. Uh, Dr. Mohammed Alamari is our IBD Advanced Fellow. Uh, coming to us from Cleveland Clinic, Florida, spending a year with us training in IBD. And then it's really an honor for me to also introduce our patient advocate, Lori Plung, who I've known for many years when I was in Pittsburgh originally and then transitioning to Cleveland. And before we're signing on, um, I would actually say that Lori is now one of the national stakeholder patients, very well known in the community and Lori, it's it's really an honor to have you as part of this discussion as well. So thank you for joining us. I think at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Falloon, who's gonna give a presentation and that's gonna be followed by a case presentation and then you'll hear from the panel and this will be an interactive discussion. We'll also certainly have time for any of your questions. So uh, throughout this, please, as you think of questions, feel free to chat them in. We'll get to as many as we can. All right, uh, Katie, uh, go ahead and take it away and thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, hopefully my slides are pulled up. My name's Katie um, and I'm excited to talk to you today about selecting the right therapy for the right patient. Um, so just my disclosures quickly, I have funding support from the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation and I served on a GI Fellow Steering Committee for Janssen. Uh, our learning our objectives for today um, so the first half of the talk, I'll spend talking about the concept of disease severity and the importance of early effective therapy. And then the second half of my thought talk, I'm going to review the evidence for treatment of unique IBD phenotypes with available medication classes. And um, so first, let's take a step back and talk about what disease severity in IBD really is. Um, and I like this was from a systematic review looking at defining disease severity, and they broke it down into three different categories. Um, the first one is the impact on the patient. So what kind of symptoms are the patients having? Are they having abdominal pain, change in their bowel habits? And how are those symptoms influencing their quality of life and their ability to function? Are they able to do things that they enjoy? Are they able to go to work? Do they have to be on disability? What's happening to the patient and their own experience? Um, and then there's also the inflammatory burden of the disease which can be measured in lots of different ways. We can look at blood work, including the C-reactive protein. We can look at stool, including the fecal calprotectin, which is a, a marker of inflammation in the stool. We can look at imaging and see how much of the bowel is involved um, and kind of how severe that inflammation is. We can look endoscopically and see 
again, how much of the bowel is involved and kind of grade the severity when we look with our scopes. And then we can take biopsies and see severity under the microscope as well. And then kind of the last little arm here is the disease course. Um, so are patients having to be hospitalized with flares? Are they having to have surgery? Are they developing complications like fistulas, strictures, perianal disease? Uh, and then also extra intestinal manifestations of their IBD. So manifestations of the IBD that happen outside the GI tract. Uh, and what we really want to do is try to prevent those disease complications and act early on in that inflammatory activity window, kind of right at diagnosis, um, where we have a chance to get good control of the disease and prevent those complications from occurring. So kind of classically, the um, what we did was start advanced therapies when there was already something bad happening. So when a patient had developed a fistula, an abscess, a stricture, something like that. And what we really wanna be moving towards is starting advanced therapy before that damage occurs at diagnosis and getting again that inflammatory burden down so that patients can feel well and function well and have good quality of life. Um, this slide and the last couple were from Dr. Aguero, but I just love it because I think it highlights sort of where we are in terms of therapy, you can see that for almost decades, really, we had really quite limited options and what we could use to treat patients. Uh, and now, especially in the last kind of 10 years, there are so many different therapies that we have to, um, to choose from, including two that were recently approved. Um, so it's an exciting time to, um, to be a provider. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of what IBD advanced therapies are available. Um, so I was just going to go through briefly the different medication classes. Um, we have the anti-TNF agents kind of over here on the far left. Um, these were our first medications that were approved for inflammatory bowel disease, um, including infliximab, adalimumab, sertilizumab, and golimumab. These can be given either intravenously, so through the IV, or subcutaneously, so as a shot. Um, they start working very quickly. Um, and they work best when combined with another um, medication class called immunomodulators, so something like a uh, thiopurine, azathioprine, for example. Um, they can be very good for patients with those disease complications that we talked about during the um, disease severity portion. Um, they are associated with what's called immunogenicity, so patients can develop antibodies to these medications uh, that can make them less effective or even uh, make them stop working. And then they do also um, influence the infection risk, and then there's um, some malignancy risk as well, kind of the one uh, I think patients worry about a lot is the lymphoma risk, which I'll talk about a little bit more later on. Um, next up, we have our anti-integrin class, that's vetalizumab, um, which is available IV and recently was approved for subcutaneous as well. And um, this one, you don't have to worry as much about immunogenicity, and it's gut selective. It works by blocking lymphocytes, a type of inflammatory cell moving to the gut. And so it has really quite a favorable safety profile for that reason. Um, last on the top here are anti-IL-12 or IL-1223 agents. That's ustekinumab, rizinkizumab, and uh, very recently mirikizumab. And these are start out as an IV and then um, maintenance is a subcutaneous dose. They work quickly and again have low immunogenicity. And they're also approved for psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. So patients who have IBD and one of those conditions, it's a really good choice. And again, a favorable safety profile. On the bottom, we have our two oral medication classes. The first is the JAK inhibitors, that's tofacitinib and upadacitinib. And um, these work very quickly. They're effective um, even in patients who are refractory to anti-TNF agents. And um, they can be good for certain extra intestinal manifestations. And um, there is a risk of herpes zoster with these medications, which can be mitigated with vaccination. Um, and uh, especially in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, for whom these medications are also used, there was increased risk of uh, major car adverse cardiac events and also blood clots. And it's so important to talk through those things with our patients. Um, and then finally, we have our S1P agents, that's ozanamod and uh, recently approved atrazomod. And these are for ulcerative colitis only, and also approved for multiple sclerosis, um, so it can be good uh, for that patient population. Um, and uh, side effect profile includes um, a decrease in heart rate with the first dose, especially, and then a decrease in lymphocytes. Um, and Kind of this slide is the safety pyramid, uh, which has been slowly growing over time as uh, more medications have been approved. 
Um, but sort of the takeaways here, I think, is that steroids are actually the medication that we use that's really the most dangerous. Um, and so when we're thinking about side effects, we really want to think about how we can get our patients off steroids and onto a maintenance therapy that's going to work well for them. Um, and then kind of our, as we talked about, the gut selective therapy and then ustekinumab, rizikizumab are among the safest kind of other agents more in the middle. Um, and then keeping in mind that also um, not treating IBD can lead to um, bad safety side effects too. And that sometimes surgery is actually the best option uh, for our patients. So now that I've given kind of this broad overview, how do I talk about this in clinic with my patients? Uh, and I think shared decision making here is really important. Uh, and there are several components to it that I think um, are worth discussing. So the first is just treatment response. Uh, and that's kind of which therapy do I think is most likely to work for this patient and why? And then the other question is how quickly is a given therapy going to work and how quickly does it need to work? So for example, a patient who has ulcerative colitis and is in a flare and is having 10 bowel movements per day and seeing a lot of blood, you really need something that's gonna kick in quickly. Um, versus someone who has milder disease um, might be able to wait for a slower onset mechanism of action with one of our other drugs. Um, the next uh, thing I talk about is safety profile. And some of it really does come down to um, individual patients and their risk tolerance. So what is their risk tolerance when it comes to medication side effects? And then also what is their risk tolerance when it comes to untreated disease, um, which can also um, lead to a lot of complications for the patient. I think when it comes to safety, it's also important to incorporate individual patient factors, such as age and comorbidities, and how that influences a given therapy. So we'll talk about this more, but for example, a young female who's hoping to have children, the safety profile for medications, I would avoid something like methotrexate, whereas an older patient who has a history of cardiac comorbidities, I'd be much more reluctant to provide one of the medications that has cardiac side effects. Um, and then the last thing I talk about is access, and, and some of this is patient-centered. So how does the patient want to receive a drug? Do they want to take a pill? Um, are they worried they'll forget and won't remember to take a pill every day? Do they want to do injections at home, or are they worried about kind of using a needle and giving themselves a shot? And um, would they prefer to do infusions, or are they concerned about transportation to the infusion center? And then um, we also have to think about costs. So what will their insurance cover? Uh, what will the out-of-pocket cost be for a given drug, and kind of is that affordable and an option for the patient? Uh, when we're presenting medications to patients, I think it's important to communicate the risks and benefits of each medication class clearly, or at least each medication class that the patient is a candidate for, and then also to counsel the patient regarding what to expect when starting the medication and how you'll monitor response. Um, so, for example, I'll let them know kind of when I anticipate with this medication, they'd start feeling better. And then also, I usually do a stool test at around three months and a colonoscopy at around six months. And um, so that just gives the patient some benchmarks for what I'm going to be looking for or what they should be looking for. Um, I also think pictures and graphics can be very helpful. And um, when I was in my IBD fellowship year, someone showed this image to me during the, um, it's called a milestone course that we take. And I thought it was very Profound because, as I mentioned, a lot of the concerns that I hear from patients when you're talking about using a medication like infliximab with an immunomodulator is the lymphoma risk. And when you break it down and kind of show this picture of these 10,000 people and say, this is your risk of the lymphoma, I think it becomes much less scary. Uh, and especially when you put that in the context of what the risk, for example, of surgery or something like that would be um, with untreated disease. Um, so that was the first half of the talk. I'm going to shift over now to unique IBD phenotypes and um, spend kind of the second 10 minutes talking about some of those scenarios. So the first um, is acute severe ulcerative colitis. Uh, this is a condition that's characterized by significant inflammation in the colon. You can see kind of these deep white ulcerations here. Uh, patients are having frequent bowel movements over six a day. And they're having signs of systemic toxicity as well. So things like anemia or low blood counts, fever, elevated inflammatory markers, so like we talked about um, during the disease severity portion, the CRP or the fecal calprotectin. They can also have tachycardia or fast heart rate. 
And in this setting, I really want a medication that's going to work quickly and that I know is going to, or I anticipate will work well. Um, and so usually that's infliximab plus an immunomodulator or a JAK inhibitor. Um, usually UPA is the preferred agent. And the other thing, all of these patients are at high risk for needing surgery. Um, and so I think it's important to talk with the patients about that early and to involve the colorectal surgeon early as well. So there aren't any surprises for anybody. Uh, next up is perianal Crohn's disease. Um, this is characterized by inflammation around the anus. You can see an MRI of a patient's anus here. Uh, and patients can develop sinus tracts, fistulae, and abscesses. And these need to be managed in collaboration with colorectal surgery. It's often a two-pronged approach here. Um, but first line, again, is going to be infliximab plus an immunomodulator. There's also emerging data um, for JAK inhibitor UPA specifically, and then also for vetalizumab. Uh, I wanted to spend some time talking about pregnancy as well, uh, because a number of our patients are young and female. Um, so this is a registry, um, the Piano registry it's called, and they looked at pregnancy and natal, natal outcomes in patients who were exposed to biologics and or thiopurines. And the data is actually um, quite reassuring with regards to exposure to these medicines. They didn't see any increase in congenital malformations, spontaneous abortions, preterm birth, or low birth weight. And what was interesting was actually that it was disease activity that was associated with an increased risk of spontaneous abortion and preterm birth, uh, which again, I think really highlights that untreated disease also comes with side effects. Uh, so my takeaways for pregnancy are that we really should be continuing any um, biologics and thiopurines throughout the course of the pregnancy. Um, but you do want to be cautious with medications where we either know they're unsafe or we have limited data. So I always stop methotrexate. This is a teratogenic medication. It needs to be stopped well before the pregnancy. Uh, and then for S1P uh, medications and also for our JAK inhibitors, we don't have enough data yet to know whether or not they're safe to use. Um, so I tend to avoid them if at all possible. Um, and I'll kind of spend the last few minutes talking about extra intestinal manifestations of IBD or EIMs. So these are manifestations of IBD that occur outside of the luminal GI tract. They can influence almost any organ system in the body. So the eyes, the skin, the bones, the liver, uh, and they're actually quite common. Uh, and they can be seen across IBD subtypes. So you see this is data here from um, a group in Switzerland followed IBD patients over the course of um, four years. And you can see about 40% had an EIM. Most had just one, but some had as many as five. Uh, and arthritis was the most common. Um, and EIMs really can present at any time. This is, again, data from that um, Swiss IBD cohort, this being time zero. And you can see most, 75% are diagnosed after. But around 25%, the EIM will be the first presenting time, sign of disease. Um, and so we'll just go through a few EIMs now and talk about therapeutic options. The first is erythema nodosum, or EN. This presents as this erythematous tender nodule uh, on the extensor surfaces, commonly of the shins. You can see a picture of it here. Often patients will say kind of it looks like a bug bite, but instead of itching, it hurts. A uh, diagnosis is typically made clinically, um, but if there's any question, you can do a biopsy and you'll see this um, septal paniculitis. So here's the septum and here's fat along the septum. And it classically goes along with active inflammation in the gut. And because of that, um, treating the underlying IBD is often enough to treat the underlying erythema nodosa. So, so for patients who have IBD and EN, Whichever medication we think um, is going to be best for the patient via shared decision making should work for the EN as well. If it's not, steroids um, can be added, and then sometimes a dermatology referral is also needed. Pyoderma gangrenosum is another skin manifestation of IBD. Um, this one is can present as this really quite painful ulcer, and you get these violaceous kind of purple borders here. Um, and it often occurs at sites of trauma. We call that pathogy. So it can be commonly seen in patients who have stomas, uh, peristomal, so around their stoma site. And this can be quite problematic because it creates difficulty for patients with pouching. Um, so if you have suspicion for pyoderma, these patients need to be seen by dermatology right away. And the PG doesn't always correlate with the IBD disease activity. So just treating the underlying IBD isn't always enough. 
Um, and in these cases, we really want to be quite careful about which IBD medication we're selecting and um, because some of them we think either will not work or um, we don't have much data. So, if I have a patient who has IBD and PG, I'm using usually starting an anti TNF agent 1st line and then 2nd line, uh, I'm thinking about a jack inhibitor. Um, our other medications, such as vetalizumab, bustakinimab, brisinkizumab, miracizumab, we're not sure. We really need more data. Um, and then we do, again, manage these patients in conjunction with dermatology. So sometimes they'll add on additional medications that are just for the PG. Uh, and if the PG is peristomal and really quite severe, um, sometimes we do need to be thinking about whether that stoma needs to be closed. Um, when it comes to eye extraintestinal manifestations, I think it's important to just be aware of this both as a patient and as, as a provider, um, because some of these conditions can be vision threatening and needed to be acted on immediately. Uh, and so we both wanna be recognizing this. Um, and so episcleritis is the one that's associated with IBD activity and luckily is the one that's most common. And the eye just kind of gets irritated. There could be a little bit of burning, but there's no pain and there's no change in vision. Scleritis and uveitis, on the other hand, are more rare, uh, run independently of IBD disease activity and can be associated with pain, tearing, photophobia, so sensitivity to light and blurring or other changes in the vision. And if there's any concern for either of these, um, then patients need to be seen by ophthalmology right away. Uh, and this is really kind of a same day ophthalmology referral or sending the patient to the emergency room if ophthalmology is not available. Again, because you wanna protect vision. Episcleritis, kind of similar to the EN that we were talking about, you can treat the underlying IBD uh, and usually it will get better. You could also use some topical adjuncts if needed. Scleritis and uveitis, you need kind of topical and also systemic medications. And my treatment approach here is usually based on discussion with ophthalmology and whatever medication they think is most likely to be effective for the uh, ocular condition, just again, because it is sight threatening. Um, often they'll start with an anti TNF agent in this setting. And then I'll um, wrap up with talking about spondyloarthritis associated with IBD. Uh, so this is inflammation of the joints. It can be peripheral and involve the joints of the extremities. So you can see kind of the swollen knee here, or it can be axial and involve the joints of the spine. Um, this is showing you kind of inflammation here along the sacroiliac joints. Um, peripheral arthritis is not destructive, so you don't have degeneration of the joint. But axial spondyloarthritis can be destructive and can lead to de joint degeneration and disability over time. So it really needs to be um, diagnosed early and managed closely with rheumatology. When we're selecting a therapy, it depends a little bit on whether the inflammation is involving only the peripheral joints or also the axial joints uh, or vice versa. Um, and the first line agent is often um, an anti-TNF. This can work quite well. And then again, your JAK inhibitors, tofacitinib and UPA also work well. For some of our newer agents, we're not sure for peripheral arthritis, we need more data. Uh, for axial arthritis, uh, not recommended. So overall, kind of the key takeaways from the session, um, early effective therapy for IBD is essential. Medication choice needs to be tailored to the disease state, uh, the associated conditions in the patient, and then also patient preferences. Uh, and we really need more research. I think you saw kind of a lot of as I was progressing through question marks or more data is needed. And there are lots of unanswered questions about how we optimally position these therapies uh, and lots of work to be done there. So thank you so much. That was a fantastic presentation, Dr. Floon. Thank you so much uh, for going through that. I think when you show that slide with all of the therapies that we have now, it's really this explosion of, of drugs that we have available to us. And the discussions we have with patients are very different now than they were even 10 years ago when maybe we only had one class of medications. And I think that's why sort of what we're gonna talk about through these cases is, is so important. It really shared decision-making is, is the buzzword now. And it's with more options, it can be a little more confusing for both patients and providers. Um, and I think that's why hopefully when we go through these cases, we can approach, give, a, give an idea for how we may approach uh, the situations, what's the best way to present information to patients, um, what is providers, what do, what do we have to learn 
uh, from the patient so that we can get them on a therapy that's going to work for them. And I should mention that Dr. Falloon is really a, a leader in the country on extra intestinal manifestations, leading a, a prospective national registry in this. And you can see that there's many different types of ways a patient can present. And that's really a, a key point of how we select therapies for patients. So it, it was great to hear your perspective on that. All right, Dr. Alamari. Uh, and again, I want to welcome our panel. So we have uh, Dr. Phil Pott, who is one of my colleagues, really fantastic uh, clinician. Uh, Dr. Reguero goes without saying is is our our boss in the institute, but also um, has really uh, been a great educator. Worked a lot with patients, an expert in really how we uh, present information to patients, and then our patient advocate, uh, Lori Plung, to to keep us all in check and make sure that that we're uh, talking in the in the right language to everybody. Okay, Dr. Alamar, you can you can take it away. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. So we're going to start with our first patient. Uh, this is a 28-year-old uh, lady with a history of ankylosing spondylitis and uveitis who's being evaluated for recently diagnosed iliocolonic Crohn's disease. She had symptoms of ankylosing uh, spondylitis dating back to 2013, and she had a total of eight episodes of anterior uveitis over the past five years. Those episodes were responsive to steroids, but unfortunately, that was complicated by steroid-induced glaucoma. The patient was offered anti-TNF therapy throughout um, the last couple years, but she was reluctant due to fear of side effects. Eventually, she was diagnosed with Crohn's disease last year at the age of 27. At that time, she presented with worsening watery diarrhea. However, she admits to symptoms since college time. She denies the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and never been a smoker. So this is her colonoscopy. And as you can see, normally we see pink mucosa without erythema or ulcerations. She has moderate inflammation throughout her colon and also mild inflammation in the terminal idiom. She was given a total symbol endoscopic score for Crohn's disease aggregate of 16. And to our patients who are tuning in, this is a scoring system we typically use during endoscopy to have an idea, about, objective idea about how much inflammation there is. Endoscopic remission typically defined as less than three, and 16 falls in the moderate to severe category. Her uh, pathology at that time showed mildly active inflammation in the small bowel and large bowel without granuloma or dysplasia. She was started on steroid right after the colonoscopy, and she came to us in the clinic afterwards, feeling better in terms of her joint, GI, and eye manifestation, but still pretty symptomatic and still having up to five bowel movements a day, uh, lower abdominal pain, and also it mentions to us that she had to skip a few days from work, and also she had a poor sleep. And those were related to the burden of her GI symptoms, mainly, and also the unpredictability that's related to that. Her labs were remarkable for elevated inflammatory markers with a FICA cap protectin more than 1800 and a CRP of 2.2, with the normal being less than 0.5. So this will be our first topping point. So, Dr. Aguero, it's, it's not uncommon that we um, come across patients who are have concerns about the therapies that, that we're talking about using. How would you put this patient's disease in context for the patient? And then sort of how would you approach that discussion with the patient who's previously avoided going on treatment? You're muted, Dr. Aguero. I think it's important to first to understand what her fears or reluctance are to the therapy. So, as, as you heard from uh, Katie a minute ago, some of the potential side effects, but also um, some of the rarity of some of the side effects and put that into context. But coming to your question, I would, um, you know, I look at a few things. Her quality of life is impacted. She's losing sleep. She's missing work. Um, she also has extra intestinal manifestations, and when I see a patient in the clinic, I tell them this is really a systemic inflammatory disease. I think the days are gone where we say it just affects your gut, and in her, it's significantly affecting not only her gut, but certainly her joints and her eyes. The fact that she's young and has glaucoma from steroid use 
I would say that's a that's a concern for the long term. So with the totality of that information, I would actually tell her that let's try to get you better, but better not just for the short term, but the long term. Um, knowing that she just got married, wants to have a family, taking that into account, knowing and telling her up front, we'll we'll have a discussion about what therapies are certainly okay to take when you're pregnant and what therapies aren't. But healing the bowel completely, which also hopefully will heal the eyes and the joints. I think that has to be the goal, and this will open up the, then the discussion about advanced therapies. Dr. Philpott, how, I guess, any additional thoughts to what Dr. Regaro said? And then also, how do you present the data to them? So, like, we saw the pictures of the colonoscopy. What's your approach to, uh, to describing what you see to the patient? How do you put it in patient-friendly words? And then, I guess we touched a little bit on the fact that this is a patient who's desiring to have children in the next few years. How do you, how do you um, put that into context with their treatment? So I there's so many layers of this, but certainly um, when someone's immune system has become so dysfunctional that it you know it's attacked their spine. So and I think looking at their journey, what they've been through and. Maybe they hadn't fully understood, but they've been having, you know, the ankylosing spondylitis, they've been having, you know, back pain that can be debilitating for years. And now their immune system's so aggressive, it's attacked a large part of their colon and their eyes. And so I think when we look at what the patient and I are looking at together is what that, like this aberrant inflammation has done, like the inflammatory burden that's been dealt to them. And sometimes when they, get the steroids, they feel better and, and you feel safer taking a pill because, you know, a steroid's a pill. And it's kind of paradoxical to understand that the medicines that I have to provide that are for infusions and injections actually have fewer risks and long-term side effects than these pills that I have in my hand, right? So if you get a bottle of pills from your pharmacist, a steroid, you feel like, how can this be not more safe than going to the pharmacist and getting this shot that I have to take every two weeks? So. Just wrapping your head around the delivery, um, really, that that's a big stepping point. I, I think that's something that I work on a lot. You know, my patients and I, we we have that discussion because, again, intuitively, you would feel like something that you're getting in a shot or infusion is a lot more aggressive than a pill. And then I, I think the next step is to give them hope that you know, I their their diseases. I am worried about them. There's a lot of things I'm hearing in this that makes me worried for this patient. This is a severe, moderate to severe disease presentation. If I don't do something, they might get even sicker and be in the hospital may need a surgery. So this is, I do have to share with them how worried I am. But then that there's hope that I see a lot of patients in this situation, I have a lot of things to offer. Um, and I think the final aspect to the, the care and then the pregnancy, you know, I wanna know what their goals are. But the other thing is, I, I think sometimes people get scared because we explained to them these medicines are treating your disease, they're not curing it. And so we we want to make sure they understand we do need to do long-term therapy. But I do tell them if I start you on something and you don't like it, you don't have to take it forever. You and I can make decisions later on and change these. Now there may be times where I think it's not the best idea, but I, I think sometimes people feel afraid if they start something, they could they may never get off it. Um, now, we don't want to start something if we're pretty sure we're going to quit it after one dose. But on the other hand, we have lots of things to offer, especially in 2023. So those are some things I like to talk to them about. Yeah, I think the, you had a bunch of pearls in what you were just saying there. I think a common question I get is, is this forever? And and like you, I, I will never say anything's forever. I say it's for now. Um, and we're going to have a year by year discussion about what your therapy plan is and as we have more options different patients are going to make different decisions and the key is really to to have that trust where we can communicate to each other what we're thinking without fear that you know uh that's going to disrupt the relationship so i think um you know for the patient it, it's it is very important to understand what their goals are because the goals may be different for one patient from another and our treatment plan is going to going to depend on what their goals are Lori, I, I think maybe we could get your perspective um, for the patients because patients do come in with some preconceptions about different medications. Do you have any tips for the patients in the audience on where they can get information that's reliable 
um, and, and how they can present that to their providers. Absolutely. So I think everything that Dr. Philpott said and Dr. Aguero said was um, spot on. I think open communication is really important to put the patient at ease when they're talking about these medications that are so scary to them. Having a chronic illness like IBD is it's a daily struggle. So patients that I speak to and support, I send them to the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. They have a wonderful um, medication um, website, if you will. Part of their website is an excellent tool. And I tell patients very often to use it either way. You know, what, if they're having this discussion with their physicians and these medicines come up, go home, do your homework, read about it. Um, and vice versa, if you've heard about a medication and you want to bring it up to your doctor to present it that way as well. And do you have any tips for us on how we should be speaking to patients about medication options, risks, like is there language that we should be using? Um... Yeah, um, so I think just to be sensitive and empathetic that these medicines are scary. They're hearing about it in the media, you know, on commercials. And, um, and when they list all those side effects, it's scary. So I think just being empathetic, compassionate, understanding their fears and communicating in a way that they feel heard, I think can be very productive. Listening sometimes the most powerful thing we can do, right? And and not just speaking and, and saying things to patients, but just pause and hear what they have to say. There's a, there's a lot we can learn from that, I think, which is- Absolutely. So, so Dr. Falloon, uh, we've been talking about how we you know, think about the severity of the patient, much like you said in your talk, um, but we haven't nailed down the specific therapy for the patient. So you just gave, you just did a, a beautiful presentation on the different phenotypes. How would you approach the treatment specifically for this patient? So I think for her, she has evidence kind of, as we've talked about is about significant inflammation in the colon and then also the axillar spondyl arthritis or ankylosing spondylitis as it was called here um, and the eye. So kind of those would all check mark an anti-TNF therapy. And so something like infliximab would probably be my first choice, but I would be interested in talking with her more because it's the risk of lymphoma that she's most worried about. And then I'm suggesting the therapy that has that risk. So I'd want to talk through that with her a little bit more. Um, but infliximab would be my first choice for her. And in terms of the desire to have children, again, how would you how would you frame that for her with with your recommendation of the infliximab? Yeah. So I mean, I think if that's her goal, that becomes my goal too. And I want to try to help her get there. And I think active disease, as I was mentioning, is something that's going to potentially keep her from having a pregnancy or put her at increased risk of complications during the pregnancy. Um, so I would frame it as trying to get the disease under control so that she can achieve the goal of pregnancy. Um, and then specifically with the infliximab, we do have, and I would use probably combination therapy with her to start. And we do have data for both infliximab and for combination therapy um, that it's safe to continue throughout pregnancy. And we could talk in more detail about how all of that would look. And um, the other option you could consider for her if she were, um, it's not yet FDA approved, but if she were a refractory to the anti-TNF would be a JAK inhibitor with her other comorbidities. But that's something I would be hesitant to do for her because she does want to have children. And and just for the audience also, when we're talking about combination therapy and safety in pregnancy, obviously we're talking about thiopurines as the combination therapy medication, not methotrexate, which um, would not be something we would use in a patient who's hoping to become pregnant in the near term and during pregnancy. Um, th there's one other point on the slide that the patient is asking about a dietary approach. This is something that we commonly come across in our practice. I think, uh, Dr. Reguero, you know, with all your work in the medical home, this is probably something you hear a lot working closely with dietitians. How, how do you address that with the patient? Because they, they are very interested in uh, incorporating diet. Yeah, so um, as I talk about diet, I want to make a brief comment because I agree with Katie and her approach, but I just wanted to tag on to that and hearing Lori talk about kind of the perspective from the patient. I think one, one thing that's also important is to tell 
the patient, look, let's let's get you better, but let's try to get you better in the next three to four months and really better, like as close to normal as we can. And then I usually break the first year down into basically three month chunks. The first three months, the second, the third, with the third three months, the, the end of the year being, hopefully you're going back to work, you're sleeping, you're not on steroids, your eye, your joints, your bowels are much better. And we're doing another evaluation, maybe a colonoscopy or a fecal calprotectin then. then. And then I completely agree with what Jessica said. This doesn't have to be forever. And some of the side effects with things like infliximab and azathioprine, sometimes we don't see those for a couple of years. So we have a year or two to really say, let's get you better and then decide from there. One other final thing with treatment, I completely agree with um, Dr. Falloon is that Upatacitinib after an infliximab is also a good choice, even if she wants to get pregnant in the future. So it's not that she can't go on upatacitinib now. It means she just has to stop it within a month of trying to conceive because it leaves the body very quickly. All right, so back to diet. Um, I acknowledge when patients come in and tell them, uh, ask about diet, I, I, th I tell them, I think you're right. I think diet plays a huge role in IBD. We've seen an explosion in the last 20 years of IBD. It's probably something with the environment and the biggest environmental impact is probably diet. And the diet definitely plays a role and the cleaner the diet, in my opinion, the better, meaning avoiding ultra processed foods, avoiding lots of sugary foods, avoiding lots of carbohydrates, even just doing that. And probably the easiest just to say this here in the panel and when we see a patient is sometimes the Mediterranean diet. Ideally, you have a dietitian, as you mentioned, in our medical home, we have a dietitian that's involved in the care. But I affirm that I do think diet plays a role, but I would also tell her, I think we can do that, but we need to do something more. You have, bad spine inflammation, eye, and bowel. Let's use diet as a complement. Maybe if we get your diet better, we use and say infliximab, basithyperin, and we get you a lot better. Maybe over time we can de-escalate some of the medicines and focus on diet, but not yet alone. We have to do both if we're gonna do diet. We have to do something else to get your disease under control. Yeah, I think that it's a, a great point that um, really talking about how we Complement and it's important again honing on this to listen to the patient. If the patient's very interested in a dietary approach, we can't completely dismiss it. But I think there's ways to incorporate their wishes in terms of uh, using dietary approaches with medical therapy at the same time. And there's been some nice discussion in the chat. I think uh, Dr. Rogero addressed this somewhat about the JAK inhibitors, uh, and I agree completely. I think the key really to pregnancy is getting the patient well, getting their disease under control. Dr. Floon showed that it's disease activity that's really the biz biggest risk to the pregnancy. So if, you know, a JAK inhibitor is what's going to get them better, that, that may get them in better shape to eventually become pregnant. And we can talk about other strategies to try and switch them uh, to an another therapy if need be. The nice thing about JAK inhibitors is that you don't develop antibodies to them, so we can start and stop them without that particular concern. But as, as Dr. Philpott also mentioned, we don't know that if somebody responds to a JAK that they're necessarily gonna to respond to the next medication. I think as we have all these drugs in practice, we will do more research and learn about strategies of how we may use different drugs together and sequence to achieve our therapeutic goals. So with that, maybe Dr. Alomar, you can go to the, the, the rest of this case. Okay. so. Uh... Based on all these discussions, the patient was over the combination therapy between uh, an anti-TNF therapy and an immune modulator as a fibrin. And after discussion with the patient, and because she preferred injectables over infusions, she elected to go on adalimumab monotherapy every two weeks. And she came to us three months later, and to our pleasant surprise, she was doing just great. Uh, her joint and uh, uveitis were in complete remission. Joint symptoms were absolutely resolved. And her, she was having only one to two foreign ball movements while she's off steroid. Her um, fecal cap protection normalized. And when we checked her at Delimumab, a trough level was 9.3 uh, without antibodies. 
This is her follow up colonoscopy six months later while she's on adalimumab every two weeks. There was only mild inflammation and remarkable improvement from prior. And her total simplified endoscopic score was three, which goes along with almost uh, resolution or endoscopic remission. Her pathology showed only mild active chronic colitis without granulomas or dysplasia. She comes to see us again uh, one year into therapy and continues to do well without active symptoms. Her inflammatory markers were within range, and this will be our second stopping point. Um, and, and so some of the other points here are one wanting to come off the medical therapy um, and then also asking questions about non steroidal anti inflammatories. And I can tell you just having done clinic today, that may have been the most common question I received. So maybe Dr. Floon, you can address the, the NSAID question. Are NSAIDs safe? Are there situations where patients can use them? Because I think this is something very practical for them. Yeah, so I think that question is controversial because the classic teaching is kind of never use an NSAID in an IVD patient. And I think now we're seeing that occasional use in specific short time frames is okay. So I wouldn't say, yes, go ahead and take an NSAID for your headache that you have three times a week indefinitely. But if it's an NSAID for a headache once a month or something like that, and the disease is otherwise under good control, I don't think that's unreasonable. I would suggest if Tylenol works to go for that NSAID, but if it doesn't, an occasional NSAID, I'm not going to fight. I don't know if others have. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Philpott, um, I guess, do you have any other thought on the NSAIDs, but then also, how do you approach the questions about coming off therapy when the patient's feeling well? Yeah, I think in terms of NSAIDs, I, I usually try and, yeah, I tell them if you're in deep remission, one or two is not going to kill you. Um, if your orthopedic surgeon tries to put you on 800 three times a day, no. Um, I think in coming off medical therapy, I, I think it's a very valid question, and that's probably like the third most common question that we get. And because it is important to patients and to providers, they have done studies looking at this. Um, it's called de-escalation. Um, and unfortunately for uh, moderate to severe Crohn's, um, over time, the disease just comes back most of the time. So within a year, at least 50% will be starting to have more symptoms. And someone like this patient who had not only the, you know, pant, so her whole colon was inflamed and she also had the spondylitis and she also had the eye symptoms, I would give her even higher risk of it coming back within a year. So. I would highly encourage her not to come off the therapy because we just don't want to play that jeopardy, you know, throw the dice on that one since she's doing so well and it, it took so much for her to get to this point. So I, I think we have data and we want to investigate this further, you know, to continue to answer this question for patients who can come off therapy. But I, I think most certainly this patient, I would not advise her to do it because I, know that things most likely would not go well for her. Dr. Aguero, any other thoughts? How do you how do you approach the situation where patients come to you asking about de-escalation? So first of all, I celebrate their remission. Usually at this point they have their life back. Her numbers look at how good she's how well she's doing. Her numbers are great. Um, and, and I compliment them. I tell them, look, this is a journey that remember how sick you were. And now, finally, we've gotten you back to where you are. Um, this is where either I'll use my gray hair or my balding head. I'm not sure which, and I'll tell patients and I've seen this and I've seen this as recent as this week where patients were in remission for a long period of time on a single, uh, biologic. And, you know, they've had colonoscopies and I understand the human nature desire to come off therapy, but we stopped it and, and about 80% to Jessica's point will return. And some of those patients, when they return, they're much more refractory to either their original therapy or any therapy. And that's when we see the need for surgery. Um, so we haven't come up with a cure yet. We're working on it. We're hoping to get one soon. But looking at sustaining long term remission and now understanding the long term safety, which is very good with these therapies and we understand and monitor them much better to stay in remission doing well than try to come off and tempt fate. Lori, any any comments from from your side as as the patient advocate here about how how we best handle these discussions with patients. 
Yeah, so I loved what Dr. Reguero just said, you know, celebrating the journey, taking them back to where they were and how sick they were. And as a patient, you don't forget that, right? It comes right back to you. So, so, um, so celebrating that and also reminding them that you're doing well, you know, why, why, you know, why put yourself back there if we know, if we have the statistics to show you that, you know, 80% of patients end up having a problem again. Just take your shot, go for your infusion, take your pill, whatever it is, just make it part of your your daily life and your routine and, and stay well, right? Um, and I think just reminding them what it was like when they were not feeling well. Yeah, I, I agree completely. I think one, one you know, I'm not going to say that I've never had a patient de-escalate, and that's always going to be a very uh, uh, specific conversation for that patient and their life circumstances. But it is important to know where they're at in their life. What are going to be the consequences of if your disease does become active again? How's that going to impact, you know, your school, your work, your relationships? So I think we really need to know about all those variables as we think about this for a patient, and it is important to have an open discussion with them because again if you don't then then you're going to risk breaking breaking a trust with them that's right and i think also um validating that it is hard to keep up with these medications sometimes it is hard to to organize your infusions and to make sure your specialty pharmacy is sending you your injections and that the um, your insurance is, you know, um, okaying your medication for your prior authorization. There is a lot of upkeep that comes with this disease in all aspects. So I think just validating, I know this is hard, and also look how well you're doing will go a long way. Great. So, Dr. Alamar, maybe we can just uh, quickly move to the last case. I think there's a few few points we want to highlight there as well before before we wrap up. But this has been a great discussion. So um, the second case is a 71-year-old <clears throat> gentleman with history of obstructive sleep apnea using CPAP and heart failure with mild functional impairment and ulcerative colitis that was diagnosed last year at the age of 70 when he presented to us with bloody diarrhea. His initial colonoscopy showed severe mayo 3 left sided colitis and pathology confirmed a chronic inflammatory process. At that time, the patient was treated with a combined oral and topical misalamine for six months, but unfortunately did not have much improvement in his symptoms, and later he had to stop them due to a uh, severe headache. His local gastroenterologist uh, started him on a prednisone taper, and there was a lot of hesitancy to start him on a biologic agent given his age and comorbidities. So he comes to us for the first time in clinic with, um, he says that he's already on steroid, feeling better, but is still with up to five bowel movements a day, mild urgency, and he lost around 20 pounds in the past six months. His vital signs were fine, and physical examination showed some evidence of muscle wasting and signs of sarcopenia, which signif uh, signifies basically loss of muscle mass or strength, which could be age-related or also related to his protein calorie malnutrition and active inflammation. His laboratory tests were significant for iron deficiency anemia with a hemoglobin of 9.8 and a ferritin of 20. He also had low albumin level at 1.9. And stool studies were significant for uh, elevated fecal cap protectin at 1300, and he tested negative for C. diff infection via PCR. So this is his colonoscopy, and as you can see, there is ulceration and inflammation in a continuous and diffuse manner from the rectum to the splenic flexure. He had uh, scattered through the polyps in the uh, transverse colon, but otherwise normal remaining colon and terminal ileum. So he truly had severe disease mainly in the left side of the colon, with pathology confirming a moderate active colitis. So this will be our first uh, stopping point. So, Dr. Philpott, I think we, you know, this is clearly a patient with severe disease. I, I don't think we have to have a debate about what the markers are of severe disease here, but they're they're older and they have some comorbidities. H how do you approach treating the older patient with comorbidities? I think you're on mute. 
you're you're on yeah, you're on. I, I got it okay so i think like just all our patients we have to look at them as a whole patient right so not just looking at their colon but looking at all of the things that they're faced with um, and older patients are more likely to have other problems. So heart problems like he has, um, they can sometimes have kidney problems. And in fact, these can increase the risk of some of our therapies for IBD. And so it, it's incumbent on us to talk to them about the risks of these therapies and, and choose ones that fits that patient profile. And specifically infection is one of the risks we do see in older people. Um, so those are two things I keep in mind. And then cost is a, a risk to older people. So once they're on Medicare, um, the way um, drugs are afforded is different and we have to go different ways about this and they're often more often on fixed incomes. So I think when we're making these choices, again, it's just, just like we've been having these discussions, I'm looking at them as a whole patient, all these things I need to keep in mind when I'm making the decision for that patient. And, and Dr. Aguero, anything else you would say about how you approach risk um, in a patient like this? I mean, <clears throat> simply put, I would have a clear shared decision discussion with him and tell him, look, if he was, I mean, he's sick, but if he were even sicker, I wouldn't hold back on infliximab and azathioprine. That probably wouldn't be my first choice, but let's not lose sight. We have to get him better quickly because he's also then looking at a colectomy. I think in his case, it's going to boil down to vetalizumab or ustekinumab two good first-line effective therapies in UC, and probably I would go with safety and I would use vetalizumab. Also, Medicare D usually will uh, support intravenous infusions with vetalizumab and Tivio is, and I would tell them, look, let's get you three doses, three, zero to six weeks, see how you do, and then if you're doing well, let's kind of talk about what maintenance looks like. Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the, one of the big uh, considerations with all these medications is the cost for the patient. So, uh, you know, one of the challenges with patients who are on a government plan, such as Medicare, is they may not qualify for patient assistance from the manufacturers. And that can be a, a big challenge to getting patients on the therapy that we may recommend if we weren't considering cost. L Lori, any, any suggestions for patients on what they can do to educate themselves about, um, the potential costs of therapy, and then also how we should approach, you know, um, those discussions with the patients. I think you're muted as well. Yeah, I did the same thing. Um, yeah, I think those are really important conversations to have and to be aware of. Um, you know, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation has a phenomenal website and anything that you can think of is on there. So that's generally where I send, um, you know, I'll send a lot of patients there to, um, to, to look things up like that. Um, and, you know, and I think just being aware of, of how cost prohibitive it is for some of these medications and how some patients have to make those decisions based on what they can afford. Um, and it's, I think it's a tragedy. And I, and I think, you know, there are different financial assistance programs, even for older adults, sometimes through uh, the medical centers themselves, they may have uh, support services in place for the patient. So I, I think, you know, we have to really think about how we can explore all avenues for, for those patients that need these therapies. Uh, Dr. Alamari, maybe you can just show the wrap up of the slide and then, and then we can close. So basically, the patient um, was treated with IV iron infusions for his iron deficiency anemia and had a comprehensive nutritional assessment with uh, starting protein supplements and vitamins and minerals and was started on vedulizumab, did great um, with one to two bowel movements uh, a day, improved urgency with no blood in the stool and started to gain weight. His uh, numbers improved in terms of his hemoglobin, his iron albumin as well and his fecal cap protected normalized. And this is his uh, colonoscopy six months into a therapy with vedulizumab. There's remarkable improvement with subtle remaining inflammation, and mainly in the left side, essentially. And he comes to us nine months later in the clinic, and this time he reports to us having two episodes of nasopharyngitis while on veto, and also expressed um, difficulties securing transportation to his infusion sessions 
with the recent increase in his bowel movements, half with blood, up to seven bowel movements a day, and also a rise in his fecal cap protectin with a negative enteric pathogen workup. Yeah, so this, I mean, this is obviously a challenging situation for the patient, as we just talked about um, with Medicare, sometimes the infusion uh, medications are going to be more affordable as they're covered under the medical benefits for the patient as opposed to the pharmacy benefits. So, you know, I think one thing we talk about for the providers is that um, if patients have uh, uh, lost response to an anti-integrin, there's still hope that they can respond to an anti-TNF. The reverse may not be as true from more research that we're having that if you somebody fails an anti-TNF, anti-integrin may not be the next best medication. But I think um, probably in this case, if we find that there's active disease, which is indicated by the fecal cow protectin, that we do have an option for infliximab. Now that doesn't address their transportation issues. That's a, a separate story. And that's where the complexity of cost of care um, and what we can provide to patients. Is, I think we can all agree that that's a barrier that we need to overcome and really advocate for with our representatives and especially with these governmental plans like Medicare. And it might be challenging with the <clears throat> Medicare, but home infusions sometimes is an option to overcome the transportation, maybe not the insurance, but the transportation. Exactly. Agree. Well, I want to be mindful of the time and uh, really thank our panel. Um, I think this has been a, a very valuable discussion and a new, a new kind of program for us to engage with both the patients and providers, and we appreciate everybody joining us and Dr. Falloon for the fabulous uh, lecture she gave on how we select therapy. Um, we can pull up the, the closing slides. So our next program is going to be in February, the day before Valentine's Day, so you don't have to worry about uh, uh, putting, putting away your Valentine's Day plans. We're going to talk about how we monitor disease for long-term remission. I'll I'll be giving a talk and then we'll have a great panel uh, with another uh, uh, ex, uh, patient representative as well as our panelists, uh, Dr. Reeder and Dr. Nasir from our group. And we have a number of other live webcast events. I think Cleveland Clinic, you can count on us to be able to provide you with your virtual education. We had a, a great IBD program this morning and wrapped it up tonight. Uh, we have another series starting in December IBD primetime um, where we're going to that one. We're going to talk about um, some of the publication management highlights for the last year. There's endoscopy live, es esophagus live, hereditary live, IBD live, innovations in surgery. I don't know, Miguel, if you have any other live live things that we can throw out throw on the list. We need too, 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 many that, too many that we can't list on the slide. Next slide. All right, and again, want to want to thank our sponsors for allowing this to happen. And good night. See everybody. Thanks, everybody. Good night.